Joining me now is our, our food and lifestyle writer, Michelle Da Silva, who is just a very busy whirlwind of activity wherever Michelle's going. There are lots of articles that, that flow from her efforts. And uh, I'm going to ask her about her latest cooking article that appeared in the Georgia Strait. Every week she speaks to a chef and gets a recipe. So what was it this week, Michelle? So this week, uh, we featured uh, Andrea Jefferson, who is the chef owner at uh, Quince. That's a cooking school, uh, shop, uh, catering business out of Kitsilano in Vancouver. And what did you learn during your visit with Andrea? So Andrea has been teaching amateur cooks at her cooking school uh, for about eight years now. And she says that one of the most difficult things people have a, a hard time cooking at home is steak. So steak can be quite tricky because um, a lot of people don't want to buy, you know, a really expensive cut of beef and take it home and ruin it. So uh, she said the most difficult part about cooking steak is being able to check the doneness of the steak. So whether it's, you know, rare, medium rare, well done, um, completely cooked through inside. Um, so she offered uh, straight readers um, some great tips on figuring, figuring out how to cook steak well. Um, so one of the, the things that um, Chef, Chef Andrea tells us is to um, just look at the steak when it's cooking in the pan. She says that when uh, beef cooks, it will naturally shrink a little bit. Um, so you can kind of tell how far it's been cooking um, based on the size of the meat. She also says that when steak cooks, um, water is released from that steak. And so if you see a lot of water in the pan, uh, there's a good chance that your steak is quite cooked inside. Another way to tell is by actually touching the steak. Um, and she says that uh, she, she actually recommends touching the steak uh, when it's raw um, so that you can tell how um, firm it is. And then touching it every so often as it's cooking in the pan. And what, what will happen is that as the steak cooks, it becomes tougher. So um, if your steak is still quite soft, it's probably uh, still quite rare inside, and as it cooks for a longer period of time, it will get uh, tougher as you touch it. Um, the other really great tip that Andrea shares is um, to turn on your oven. So a lot of people want to, you know, just throw a steak on the grill or cook a steak on the stove in a pan, but she, she actually compares an oven to a really great babysitter. So she says, you can start your steak off in the pan or on the grill, and when you think it's almost done, put it into your oven to finish it off there. And actually that will allow you to, you know, create the sides, maybe make a salad, set the table. She says it's a, it's a really good babysitter, uh, which I think is a great analogy for, for an oven. You know, Michelle, it's a, this is good information for me because I don't know how to cook a steak and I really enjoy uh, eating steaks and cooking them, but I find it's very challenging. And uh, I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts are about should you put other things in the pan while you're cooking a steak? Should you put onions in? Should you even put vegetables in or anything else? Well, Andrea recommends um, cooking the steak separately in a separate pan. Um, and actually, if you cook it in an oven-safe pan, you can just stick that pan right into the oven um, and let it finish off in the oven. Um, but to cook your vegetables and potatoes and onions and stuff like that in a separate pan. So with... Um, the recipe that Chef Andrea shares. Um, she also provides us with a recipe for por porcini roasted uh, potatoes. So she takes um, Yukon potatoes and uh, cuts them into wedges and then covers them in um, basically dried porcini mushroom dust, which she says that you can make by taking dried porcini mushrooms and grinding them in a coffee grinder and then sprinkling them on top. And what it does is give it, it gives it a nice flavor. That's very interesting, and this is one of the things we had in our paper in the Georgia Strait this week was a focus on education, and one of the stories that I did was actually dealing with a new center at Simon Fraser University called the Center for Diaspora Studies, and it's a fascinating phenomenon, actually. What we're seeing in Vancouver is a growing number of people who are living here, who've moved here from other countries, so they're called members of a diaspora, whether it's the Chinese diaspora, the Indian diaspora, the Arab diaspora. And so the goal is to look at um, the people who are living here and what effect they're having in their home countries. 
So we've seen that for many years with the Ismaili community, um, which came from East Africa largely. It's, it's a sect of Islam that's, that's an offshoot of Shia. And the Ismailis have been phenomenal in terms of their international development work, their aid, setting up schools in places like Tajikistan and Pakistan, and, and, and many other communities are doing the same. So what SFU is doing, they've got a center now that's studying that. They want to get research questions from the community, but they also say that diaspora should not be just looked at in terms of the global south, like Africa, South America, uh, parts of Asia, uh, but actually there's a Canadian diaspora, for instance, and a significant Canadian diaspora even in China and in Hong Kong. And so they have a goal to study them as well. And we've also seen that diaspora should not necessarily be kind of romanticized because sometimes there are some problems, like we've seen with the uh, Sikh diaspora in BC. Um, certain elements within the community were linked to the bombing of the Air India plane. So, and, and we've also seen in Ukraine where the Russian diaspora is uh, raising concerns and the Ukrainian diaspora is raising concerns and sometimes that can lead to conflict. So I'm very excited about this Center for Diaspora Studies at UBC. So that was also part of our educational coverage this week. <laughs>